afternoon. Um, my name is John Livongo, uh, publisher of The Elephant. And today, this afternoon, it's my, my honor to be interviewing Professor Fumi Olonisakin, uh, who is Vice President and Vice Principal International, uh, Professor of Security, Leadership and Development at King's College London, and is also founder of the Africa Leadership Center, uh, which is uh, headquartered here in uh, uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, yes, is one of uh, Africa's um, leading um, um, researchers uh, around the issues of security, uh, leadership, uh, and development. And uh, is I think I, I, you should be now uh, for me the most senior African woman in the British Academy. Totally. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I haven't know. actually thought about it, but... Uh... I, I, I searched a little bit. I, I, I don't think there's uh, uh, an African woman who, was, uh, uh, who is at your level anywhere in, uh, in, in the academy in, in Britain. So, Hongera for that, congratulations. We are very, we are very proud of you and all the work that you've done. And thank you for, for granting us this interview. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, John, for inviting me to do this. It's good to see you again. Nice to see you again. Uh, I want to start for me to ask, how, how are you doing? How, how's your family? You know, uh, you know, we've been reading about uh, the UK. Uh, thankfully, the prime minister who got coronavirus is now recovered and back at work. But it's, it's, hit, you, it's hit you hard. Uh, so are you in lockdown? And, and how? Yeah, uh, we remain in lockdown. We remain in lockdown uh, yes. for another three weeks now, uh, thereabout. Yes. It, uh, and it's been about a month uh, of lockdown in the UK, in that sense. Um, we, we're all coping with life. It's a new life. Yes. Uh, there's no question about it. It's a new life and we're adapting. We're having to adapt rapidly. Uh, for those of us that are in the diaspora, that are Africans in the diaspora, uh, we have families scattered in different places. You just have to hope for the best. Um, within, you know, from a King's perspective, we spent so much time trying to ensure that our international students who wanted to go back home return safely. We still have some in the residences uh, that we're looking after. So it's not been a very easy period. But uh, it's been good to see that we've all come together and we've been adapting uh, to the situation. It raises a whole number of questions in any case. I, I, future holds. I'll, I'll definitely be asking uh, uh, you a bit more about that later because I know one of the, the areas that you have, your research has focused on in the past has been higher education in Africa. So I'll, I'll ask about the, what is the future of higher education in Africa mm. in, in, in this uh, COVID era. Uh, but, but let me start, um, Fumi, with how you would characterize the, the challenge that COVID presents um, to, 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 to leaders, in, in the, to leadership in Africa. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and how, um, you know, how should it uh, be... Uh, you know, addressed. I mean, what what uh, uh, what symptoms of 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 is it exhibiting? Is it causing to be exhibited by our leadership that you would have expected? And uh, what symptoms are you observing, which are perhaps new and may point to, an, uh, perhaps hopefully, a new direction? That's interesting. No, no, it, I mean, really, the, the real test of leadership, I think uh, we see the real test of leadership during crisis moments. Uh, and this, the, the, this is a leadership in crisis uh, uh, moment across the board, globally, but, but certainly in, in Africa. And I, I, I think from a leadership standpoint, and you know that I've spent the last 10 years, you know, uh, going back and forth, trying to really see uh, what it is that we have done uh, around leadership theoretically and practically. And more often than not, uh, the practice of leadership looks very, very different from the theory. But this is one of the few moments that we can begin to see some kind of coming together. Um, because when you have, uh, when we have an emergency like this, uh, what it means for leadership 
is that you have to you you have to step into a place you've never been before. This is an unknown, unprecedented uh, a, a disease. Uh, it's never been seen in this way, even when you look at the Spanish flu uh, of 1918, that also hit the world in this particular way. Uh, so leaders, in fact, leadership is tested at a moment like this, because you have to move from the everyday routine. Uh, we can claim to be doing leadership on a daily basis, but more often than not, we're just responding to routine challenges that we know uh, as academics in this uh, field, we we'll call it, it's deja vu. You know what it is, and yeah. so you can respond to it. But, yeah. but when you're presented with a challenge that you have never seen before, yes. it tests for the first time uh, what the quality of leadership is that exists in the society. Uh, and to my mind, for every single society, not just, uh, not just in Africa, globally. That's true. The question of societal mobilization uh, is the critical factor. Can we really achieve that effective societal mobilization as a critical success factor in responding to emergencies like this? Um, some leaders uh, have failed at it, others have succeeded uh, at it. But when we're talking about societal mobilization, it has to look at the whole picture, the whole of the picture of that society, an aggregation of all the people and the resources available uh, to effectively fight um, the enemy. This enemy now, I'll be speaking from you know, a, a security perspective or a war and peace perspective, this disease is as though we're in war. Uh, we're at war globally. Yes. And so uh, the ability to achieve uh, societal mobilization to, to fight this effectively is what has been tested. And an underpinning assumption, and just to say there are two things that therefore we have to use to uh, assess the quality of leadership uh, in Africa at this moment. Number one, it's the degree to which um, the society feels, uh, across society, leaders and their people, feel that they can collectively respond, that they have been commonly threatened. Uh, and that sense of common, uh, a shared purpose, whether it exists or not, whether we have a common understanding of the threats that we face is one issue. Uh, but we also there uh, uh, have to go quickly into another issue, which is whether at all there's the leadership infrastructure. Mm. In, ac across the board, this has been tested. Uh, in some societies, you see a residual kind of surplus in the leadership infrastructure. In some, there's a, a complete deficit. And what do I mean by that leadership infrastructure? Um, we tend to, on a day-to-day -day basis, talk about the hardware, the hardware of, you know, of leadership. And that's the governance, the institutional, the visible things that we see. We have a government, we have leaders, we have you know, various arms of government. We have, you know, parliament, you have, have the places we visit. Uh, if you like, the sites where we perform all of this. They do the routine everyday things. Mm. But the software of it is hardly ever tested and many leaders get away with it. That software or, you know, in that leadership infrastructure speaks to the existing uh, level of trust. Whether we feel that we can, you know, across society, we have enough, we can tell ourselves and see it, we trust that we're moving together and we rely on each other to work for the common good. And a big test for our leaders, and it's a leadership test across the board, is whether the people perceive them to, be, to have been working for the common good and therefore can be, you know, that they can be trusted when they tell their people to lock down, to isolate. Um, uh, you know, this feeling that we're all in this together, we have your back, and if there's any detriment, detrimental effect, uh, you know, you have to socially and socioeconomically immunize the people, and right? they have to believe that you will immunize them from the fallout of staying at home, uh, loss of earnings, loss of learnings in the case of students. Yes. So, so, so that, that basis, uh, and it relies on a trusted relationship and if it's not present between people, uh, between leaders and their people, you hope uh, you know, that it's present in segments of society 
where you have a good exchange of influence. That is what is being tested. And so a, a willingness to take action collectively to move us in the common good. Uh, and therefore, if we have places where people look at uh, what they have to do, uh, because you have to stay home, you walk on the streets, and this is where the divisions, the gross inequalities that we find uh, on our continent. Even here, I have to say that a new, a, a new script is being written about where leadership is emerging from. A new script is being written about uh, the people who really work for society. And that's where you see the nurses, the security people, the porters, all of these people who are really on the front line. And in Africa, you are asking people, uh, we are saying to our people, be on the front line, but there isn't that kind of protection for you. So it, 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 I think governments are being tested and leaders in uh, uh, formal positions of authority, uh, they're being tested as to the robustness with which they can respond uh, to that kind of demand. This situation demands that we see the gross inequalities and we're able to respond to it. In some of the countries, the, uh, it's members of the elite group that are you know, flaunting their own rules, yeah. uh, the rules that they've established. Um, but then uh, the vast majority of people are just at a loss uh, to stay home. I know you and I can stay home, or at least in my case, thankfully at this moment, I just about can stay home work from home without um, uh, financial repercussions for some time. Yes. Many people from day one, self-employed people, um, they lose income. And if, if, they, if they don't have that socioeconomic immunity that tells them that they would not be the only ones who suffer, um, whilst uh, certain other people are immune from that kind of suffering. So, so the health and the security and the development, they're all interlinked at this uh, particular point in time. But what I find fascinating though, is that we are having to go back to a hundred years from, you know, a hundred years ago, uh -huh. to learn lessons um, from the Spanish flu, which hit, as you recall, hit a lot of port cities, was as global as this in 1918. It was, it spread rapidly, within a period of three uh, to four months, it devastated Lagos, uh, devastated Nigeria, devastated South Africa. Two examples at this moment uh, mm. of states that are responding perhaps somewhat differently uh, to, to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, John, you saw how the, some of the very things we see now are the things that, you know, at least when you read the literature, you see that uh, in a colonial, uh, under a colonial governance, you saw how trust was everything, even yes. though everyone felt threatened by the disease. Yes. But yes. they did not trust the, uh, you know, the system, the authorities enough to say we are sick. Yes. yes. People hid the sickness. They died in large numbers. They ran out of Lagos in that port city. Like today, the leadership test was how do we balance the health of the people with the economy? Those ships were coming in, uh, in, in British West Africa at least. And so you, were you to protect the trade and the trade route and the people, would you contain it? Uh, and how would you do it? But without the trust inherent in that relationship between those who were governing and the governed, um, many lives were lost invariably, uh, you then had to forcefully get people to be tested. Yes. Uh, and that itself was a problem. Leadership emerged in a, in a separatist environment where medical doctors were separated from, uh, you know, by uh, who was European and who was native. Yes. Leadership emerged from the natives in terms of how to respond to this. We're facing a similar moment now in the same way that you had to rely on influencers in society to help um, with communicating, with influencing society to manage the situation. We're doing that today. Yes. But at that time, we, you could see a situation where, you, where you'd say it's a colonial system that was trying to coerce yes. uh, or manipulate, but coerce in this case because there was no other way to deal with the fact that people were not trusting the system to report themselves that they were safe, to allow themselves to, to, be, to be checked. 
But today we're, we're finding places where we're using force, where our security forces are exercising that same kind of coercive power against the people. Uh, I uh, understand as at yesterday, more people had died at the hands of uh, our, uh, our police in Nigeria um, than had died from coronavirus. We've seen how in the streets of South Africa, the police are, uh, you know, also having to resort to the same measures. This is where the hardware of leadership does not match the software of it, as I was talking about. And, and that discrepancy, uh, to think that we saw that a hundred years ago, uh, and we're seeing the same sort of things now, even when governments that are well-meaning, that are leading, uh, where, where leaders are making the right statements, the machinery that is in place is not living up to the kinds uh, of leadership that we're trying to offer. I think this gap is a real gap uh, that we have to address across our continent, even, even where uh, you see leaders making the right statements and setting the right, uh, striking the right tone. If, 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 if I can ask, um, and uh, as you can notice, we've, we've just gone into a, a rainstorm here, so it's become a bit dark. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll get some, some lights on. Okay. And, um, um, but for me, you know, again, just gazing into your your your, your crystal ball, um, what what do you think the implications will be um, of of um, of the of, of leadership failure uh, in some countries where where the leadership is unable to? You know, I, I was telling some some colleagues that the bigger risk, uh, the risk that is bigger than corona, the virus itself, mm. is, a, is a failure in imagination uh, and, in, and in an ability of the leadership to, at that moment, inspire the people that uh, what we are doing is in your interest uh, and it is difficult, but it is the only way to deal with the challenge that is uh, confronting us. Mm. Um, what will happen to those regimes and administrations um, in many parts of the world that will um, continue with business as usual, mm. number one. Number two, will co continue to think that securitizing this problem is the way to go. So heavy and heavier use of police and military. If that is accompanied by a growing number of of deaths, um, uh, what what do you think the the outcome will be? Yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure that uh, it can be business as usual for that much longer. Okay. It, it, to my mind, it cannot be because going back to what is missing, the missing bit in that infrastructure, the software that is missing is is, is the simplest aspect of leadership which relies on relationship building. A relationship building that ensures that there are mutually held goals, a sense that we are all in this situation together and we will move together to solve the problems. And if how we decide to do that is to retreat to manipulation and the use of coercive uh, force uh, to, do, to achieve that, we're dealing with a brand new generation of people Mm. And I, I should have said earlier that the difference between 1918 and now is that technology, a new uh, generation of young people who are confident, who will ask questions of their leaders, who will disrupt to find the right software to help them move forward. And they're impatient as well. Okay. Under those circumstances, I do not see how uh, leaders can do exactly the same thing they're either going to authentically uh, participate and encourage participation of the whole of their society in solving a problem uh, in front of them. Uh, and that requires a completely different scenario. It requires a completely different way, way of doing things. Again, the lesson to learn from when uh, the colonial uh, uh, government yes. could, no, could not be trusted by the people is that they had to retreat to a place where they used those who were trusted by the people yes. uh, 
to share information, explain, achieve a common understanding as to why, what, uh, why they were doing what they were doing, and also put those people in leadership. So the natives, uh, so-called natives in the health area were on the front line, but also local publishers like yourself. Yes. Uh, you had Lagosians who had, even at that time were you know, influential publishers, uh, newspaper houses. Yes. Um, they also used religious leaders. And so those, you have to retreat to the part of society where there's residual leadership infrastructure, where people already exchange influence to try to solve their problems. It also means that the rigidity of uh, governing only one mode or leading only one way uh, has to be abandoned. Yeah. And it, you're forced to work with where influence is at. And I think this is what those leaders who find out that coercive power, that the use of force is not working, that's what must happen. Because typically in African societies, we have leadership in abundance. They're in the channels of influences, the relationships that people form to collectively solve their problems. And that has gone on across um, other layers of society in non-formal parts of society, but we never even transfer that to the formal parts because we have been used to using a hardware, uh, albeit an outdated one. Uh, and what coronavirus is doing is it's forcing us to do things differently. And we're going to see that uh, across the board. Uh, and one important thing, if you, it will fuse the, the po politics, uh, the political and the social arena, uh -huh. and the economic arena, it will fuse them in ways that we have never really seen. Uh, because uh, for temporary political processes, I call them temporarily because temporary because they're, they're supposed to be part of a continuous process. But yeah. the ways in which we engage elections in Africa, where we are very we very intensively uh, speak to our populations and you know galvanize action during uh, a narrow period, uh, and if you like convene around a narrow identity factors which will build mutuality for a short term, uh, will not have binding mutuality in an environment like this. It doesn't matter that we're kith and kin. The fact is, uh, I'm not sleeping in your house at this moment, uh, uh, you know, uh, to be, I, I'm not being fed in your place. Uh, no one is being fed in my place. I'm looking after myself. And so it doesn't matter how much we mobilize, uh, you know, uh, narrow identity uh, formations for political gains, it will not work at this that, moment. That, that, uh, for me, that sounds yeah. uh, quite hopeful, um, though I would like you to sort of dig a bit further. I mean, our politicians, you're right, um, typically mobilize at most in the year running up an election. Our political parties are very, very transient creatures. The leadership uh, of, of all these parties has also been in the leadership of, 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 of the other parties. So these are really, um, uh, you know, uh, special purpose vehicles for winning uh, power. They're not institutional in, institutions. And, um, and yes, they mobilize around uh, issues of identity. So you mobilize your tribesmen first, your clansmen, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and you mobilize them to win power. Uh, and once once you're there, you know the, 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 the implicit understanding is that uh, you shall extract and it shall trickle down to them uh, in in greater quantities than it will trickle down to those who do not vote for them. But what I hear you saying is that that model has been that model has also been disrupted by um, uh, coronavirus. Um, sh should we be hopeful? I, I mean, I think now it's up to imagine this. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. Yes. We don't find a, a treatment or a vaccination quickly. We're likely to have many months of, a, of particular forms of uh, social distancing, particular forms of isolating different people and different communities of people. And in that period, leaders will be tested to the limit. Questions will be asked about their ability 
to not just provide some tiny hand, handouts uh, to uh, families of, that cannot exist on those handouts, uh, whatever bags of rice we are giving. Uh, I saw some very colorful picture of a, a governor of one of your counties uh, the, the other day. Uh, I don't know how true it is, whether we're going to give alcohol, give other sorts of you know, short-term uh, palliative, uh, uh, if you like, uh, remedies. We will have to step up and mobilize the whole of society and our economic capacity. And it will be a leveler. It's already a leveler. The disease itself is a leveler. Yes. The ways in which we deal with it will level us, level things very quickly. Uh, and therefore, the longer this goes on for, in, to my mind, uh, the more we're likely to see new forms of adaptation and new ways of engaging. Uh, and it means that this generation of people will ask a different set of questions when next elections come around. Uh, I was drawing an analogy between uh, coronavirus and, and war. Um, mm. Some of the people I uh, interviewed in the 80s uh, who had fought in Burma at the time, who were still alive and fought in, in Burma in the Burma war, um, you know, talked about how it was an eye-opening experience for them. You're on the battlefield, you suddenly realize that it's possible for Europeans to die just the same way that Africans die, um, all right? And that picture stayed with them and when they thought about the idea of uh, independence, of gaining political independence, it suddenly became possible. And you've, you've seen this with the nationalist movements uh, across the continent. Wars, which is what this is uh, at this moment as well, a form of war uh, that we're waging against this virus, um, lay bare a number of you know, weaknesses in the systems. They also show us where the strengths uh, in our society would lie. And therefore, part of what we're seeing at this moment is we're seeing leadership uh, strengths as well as leadership weaknesses across Africa. And citizens would note that. There will be no hiding place, to my mind, for leaders who do not re respond effectively uh, at this moment in time. It will be remembered. Uh, let me put it that way. I think it will be remembered. And therefore, the, the politics as usual, the business and, as usual approach to politics uh, might be very hard this time around. I hope, I, I hope that's right, because I think Africa needs uh, uh, some, some kind of, you know, innovation, <laughs> change. Yes. Change. Um, um, yeah, you know, which, which, which actually uh, feeds into the question that uh, I think you've already answered of, of how you think uh, elites will, will reorganize. But I think the way you're describing it, they will be reorganized by yeah. the circumstances that are unfolding. And so it's for them to be extremely nimble and, and, uh, and empathetic to the people they, they say they serve if they are going to survive this. Absolutely. But certainly new leaders will emerge. Yes. New leaders will emerge who can respond. Yes. Who can be part, you know, of society in a, you know, in a more authentic way. This is what whoever, um, wherever the influence is that responds to this in the most effective way in any society is the leader of tomorrow. Um, situations create such leaders. Uh, situations make leaders, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Um, if, if I, I mean, what, 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 you know, one, one cadre of leaders across the African continent that wields considerable influence over people's lives and the way they organize them and the values which inform their behavior are religious leaders. Yes. Um, and they wield more, more influence in Africa than, and, and Latin America, say, than they do in, 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 you know, in England, like where you are, Europe, uh, etc. cetera. Um, their, 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 their response to the COVID-19, um, uh, uh, especially to the measures that were announced in response to it, um, has been mixed. Um, you had a number of, especially some of the Pentecostals and Evangelicals, even some of the Catholic uh, leadership um, uh, resisting um, calls to stop uh, congregating. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, so they're basically resisting the physical distancing that that seems to be is essential to deal with uh, with this particular uh, uh, virus at this time. Um, how how do you think this important uh, group 
uh, will come out of this. Uh, given that, yeah, we have seen, uh, and, and, you know, here in Kenya, uh, um, a bit of cynicism has developed, and you see it on social media a lot, um, and in other countries as well, of some of the pastors who are complaining most bitterly. And people saying, listen, you people seem to be only worried about the tithe that we, the money that we, we come to give on Sunday uh, when we come to church. Uh, and suddenly that narrative has gained some currency. Mm. Uh, and I was going to ask, uh, this, this, this is a, it's a group that is more influential here than it is in, obviously, uh, where, where you are. But mm. what do you think the implications are for, for, for our religious leaders, given mm. this? But by the way, the religious leaders are also influential here yes, uh, and yes. across different uh, communities. It's just that they types. Uh, yes. If you look at the Africa, the, uh, uh, Africans in diaspora, they also have the same sort of influences you're talking about, uh, yes. applies in, in Europe and North America and, and other places. And thank you for this question. Um, why? Because it helps me expand on the idea that uh, leadership, the leadership that is missing, that we, that infrastructure that is either surplus or in deficit, and in many places it's in deficit, applies not only to the formal institutions or political or economic governance as we know it. It applies also to the social systems that we have been used to. And it will call into question, uh, if you like, the leadership, um, the quality of leadership amongst religious leaders as well. Because for the first time, we'll be able to see uh, which leader, which, uh, you know, uh, if you like, supposed leader, uh, because I, I try to really distinguish between leadership and, you know, uh, and leader, the individual, yeah. right? Or which of them uh, who claim to be exercising leadership are doing so truly uh, because they feel a sense of mutuality, a sense of common purpose with the people in their congregations or in their, you know, in their immediate social uh, environments? This is the question. And it's true that cynicism that you've talked about, I've uh, heard it aired in different ways when, uh, when society, when the government and people are moving steadily towards beating this virus. And when some people feel that they need to congregate in very tight spaces um, to worship. And then it actually, you, some ask, is God not present also in the home? Mm -hmm. uh, some would ask, is God not present, you know, in the mind of, uh, you know, in very small spaces between two people, uh, amongst uh, 10 people. Uh, and that begins to show that even within religious bodies, there are leadership deficits that need to be addressed as we move forward. There's no hiding place either. Uh, for people who, who uh, claim to be uh, religious leaders who are shown uh, to not really care that much about uh, the people that they serve. Uh, the other question that is asked about this, and I've been in different conversations where this, uh, you know, has been coming up, you know, across the board around leadership, is how many of the religious leaders have devoted so much time to being on the front line uh, at this, as we speak, at this moment, uh, to go uh, really give palliative care to these very people that have been left out of the system. I, I talked about the inequality earlier. How many of you know? How many of these people are doing that? Are present on the front lines? Questions will be asked of them, of everyone across the board. I think. Uh. Absolutely correct. Um, one of the observations that has been made, uh, especially about the response of um, of various governments in 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 the West to to the COVID uh, nineteen pandemic, yeah. has been. It seems as if the countries where the prime ministers are women, yeah, the response has been far more uh, timely, effective, uh, empathetic. I mean, they're just on on top of their game completely. Um, uh, can you reflect on this? Uh, it's also no, not only where 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 the where, where the prime ministers are women, but where the ministers of health are, are, are women. There seems to be a definite. Um, I mean, I've, I've not studied this academically, but there seems to be a definite difference in approach uh, between um, 
these 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 kinds of uh, governments and and uh, and the male dominated ones fascinating i mean uh, so so you you've uh, given me a very clear research question for my students uh, uh, next <laughs> next academic term but yeah. but really uh quite frankly when people talk about new zealand when they talk about um the quickness uh, of action across the board when we've taken some of those uh, so-called successful examples so far because we don't know uh, we're still watching the trajectory uh, of this virus um, I think there's a question there to be to be asked uh, when you look at even some of the some of the health ministers some of the foreign ministers uh, foreign affairs ministers and so on we have to really look at that evidence but there have always been gender dimensions to leadership anyway Yes. that given the socialization, uh, the differences in socialization uh, of men and women, uh, leadership styles have tended uh, to be very clearly different. Uh, not all the time, but you can see patterns in which if uh, women are not co-opted uh, after being socialized in a particular way, and uh, you will talk about leadership styles uh, that are less transactional, that are probably more transformational, you talk about styles that are probably more democratic, not all the time, uh, because if you study the patterns across the board, you, 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 there's a, if we look, if we move away from the idea of uh, male, female, and look at leadership patterns uh, in either feminized or masculinized ways, you can look at those styles. And you'll find women who exercise the masculinized uh, uh, approaches to leadership and there's a lot of literature that fine literature around this um, and then you also uh, look at those who study androgynousness in leadership uh, that you see the two uh, the you know both feminine and masculine uh, if you like ways and approaches res residing in one individual that you do not see first whether they are male or female but I, I tell you uh, why I have always thought what I've always thought about the male, female, or the, uh, uh, how, how men and women emerge in leadership. Women tend to emerge in leadership, uh, having considered all of those processes of socializations, they tend to emerge in moments of crisis. Why? Because society of followers um, really picture. So, so it doesn't matter how successful you are on paper as a woman. If society has been socialized to think about women in particular ways, very often you find that perception of society about how women do their job is always more negative than the actual record of performance. But, but actually in a moment of crisis, uh, no one is thinking that this is a man or a woman. No. You just want the job done. Yeah. Uh, and I, 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 in the examples I have studied over time and I've not come down uh, uh, very hard in one, you know, uh, on the side of uh, one view or the other, because this is research that continues. Shows anyway that those who are typically not seen as part, uh, as if you like the core or dominant part of a, a social identity group, no one thinks about all of that. They tend to emerge when there's a problem to be solved. So the situation makes uh, for that emergence. How we assess effectiveness is something else altogether. But on this occasion, you can take a look at those countries and their leaders and look objectively at the achievements of those women without coloring it with any kind of gendered you know, uh, perception. It's, it's what I think uh, about, about that. Thank you. Um, I, you probably, you know, you've already answered part of this question, uh, but let me put it to you again because it's been an area of specific research by you for a long time, for me, which is, uh, and I, it's early days yet. What do you, what are your initial reflections as to what the security implications of the COVID uh, pandemic are going to be, um, especially uh, for us here in Africa? Um, what possible new challenges will we face and what kind of reorganization will be required uh, to sustain uh, um, security? And I mean security, uh, not only uh, just physical security, but security in, in, in the broader 
sense in terms of uh, this one has really, you know, uh, raised issues of just security in terms of health. Just you know, for, absolutely, uh, yeah. Um, uh, education, uh, economic well-being, etc. Uh, what What is your sense of some of the the clear and present challenges, and and uh, you know some of your reflections on on how they should be tackled? Hmm. So I, I, I think that that's a very important question. Um, I think for one, we're going to, the way in which we really think about uh, public expenditure, mm. all right, uh, will be very different. Mm. Um, I think the longer this continues, uh, and there's evidence to suggest uh, even in initial research now that this will probably be uh, something that will be with us for some time. Um, and I, there are two dimensions to this uh, for me when I'm thinking of uh, Africa, about Africa. One dimension is how we organize ourselves to respond to the things that threaten us and threaten our environment. The other dimension is how we engage the rest of the world. When you think about the threats that we face and how we think about those th threats, the existential threats will stop being the threat uh, the threats that are applied to our physical beings uh, because we have the military uh, uh, or because we have armed conflict and so on. I have a feeling that we would have to reorganize ourselves uh, differently and in groupings and in small, smaller clusters and so on. And it costs more to do that as well. It, a shift in how we do things, but also a, a shift in how we allocate resources. And I do not see uh, because if, if, this what, if this means what I think it means, uh, it means that the business uh, of being in close proximity for some time means that even regular military formation, uh, regular training uh, uh, of forces and so on will have to take place in a different way. But I think we'll have to expend resources on a new way of life and on a new kind of threat on being able to really make our citizens healthy, physically and mentally healthy for some time. For the first time, certain uh, activities might, might occupy a lion's share of our, of our national budgets. And that's interesting. Yes. Our national budgets may not have the same sort of, um, if you like, support or aid that comes from outside uh, in, in real ways, because every other country is trying to secure itself. Correct. Even even the very uh, interestingly though the EU is still disbursing, we're still giving emergency support. We have seen philanthropies uh, uh, give support, but all of that might change. Also, depending on what the global market looks like, what worries me more in security, uh, uh, in terms of security at this moment, has to do with uh, immigration uh, and migration, uh -huh. uh, in a sense. Because if what we suspect is the case, again, epidemiologically, we don't know what uh, uh, is going to happen. There's still a measure of uncertainty with, with this virus. But if Africans are more of carriers um, and they are asymptomatic, if they are asymptomatic carriers, um, then the kinds of things we've seen in China, uh, where in places where you have forced testing, it means that Africans will be forcefully tested. And if they're shown to be positive, they will be perceived as carriers in those societies. And actually it means that the ways in which we travel and uh, you cannot be going for a conference of three days anymore anyway, and then you have to be in isolation uh, for 14 days before, <laughs> before you go anywhere. Many things will change, but I think um, immigration rules might change towards Africans if we happen uh, to be more of carriers um, of this virus. I don't know, there's an uncertainty around that. But if it emerges that that is the case, that will be a security issue uh, within Africa, outside of Africa. But I think security would have to be rethought in very fundamental ways in which what threatens, what creates existential threats will move from the ways in which we have looked at it as a state. Uh, you know, because states will think about territory, will think about those who defend that territory, and at the same time, we've never really been able to successfully defend uh, any of our territories. Anyway, we do not, we have never really had that monopoly of the means of force across the board. 
Uh, therefore, we still have non-state um, security people that carry arms. Uh, that might uh, continue for a moment within a national context, depending on what is at stake. But I think the collective redefinition of security in a way that reflects the common good for real is what we're going to see. If this continues for longer, I think we'll be compelled to think about insecurity across the board and not what works for the state in an artificially, superficially separate way uh, from what works for people. That's not a bad thing if no, that happens. But you know, it, 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 it isn't indeed. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, what, what, what this pandemic has done is also um, make obvious to, to everyone in, 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 a, in, a, in a stark way. It's, it's, it's been developing for some time that we are living in a multipolar world, that uh, we've been talking of a rising uh, China, but we are now faced with a, a risen China. Uh, we are, you know, it's, it's, it's a multipolar world. Uh, we have uh, increasingly assertive Russia, Turkey, India, etc. Um, and um, and then we've you know we've seen the kind of response uh, to this crisis, to this pandemic that has come out of the U.S. Yes, which has been you know um, leader of the free world up to now. Um, but uh, there are now you know people uh, questioning that, uh, and incredibly, there's even a, a tiff between the WHO and 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 the white house um, mm. at this time which is really uh, would have been unthinkable for a u.s administration uh, yes. since the second world war i i think uh, for that at this time faced with this kind of crisis uh, um, uh, a disagreement of this nature breaks out between the lead international multilateral organization that is responding and the leadership of the US. So something has clearly changed in the US that is, that is very important. Just share some of your reflections of how this, this new world and, uh, and Africa's place in it and the opportunities and risks that we face. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, 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 I agree with uh, that observation that you've made. We have a situation where clearly, even on the continent of Africa, if you look at the African Union, if you look at any of the regional bodies, um, have you seen, and globally as well, the EU, um, I can't, um, have not caught up with ASEAN, uh, ASEAN that much, uh, but look at, G, look at G7, G20, there has not been uh, a, an attempt to have a collective conversation as to how, I mean, of late now, then when it comes to vaccination, and so I can see the movement towards that, you know, uh, around, around Europe uh, to a certain extent. But there was not a collective conversation amongst any of these bodies in a way that talked about how they will robustly deal, collaborate and deal with this pandemic. Everyone just retreated to their own national boundaries and they have been doing their own thing. But then you would uh, begin to see um, so, so I, told, I mean, I, I don't know to what extent is a function of uh, gender, but if, uh, uh, at the point we we're making before around New Zealand, around uh, Germany, but uh, you could also see an, an asserting of power uh, coming from China, uh, trying to assist Italy, trying to everything that's been done has been on an individual, uh, on the basis of the action of individual states. Um, of course, it's typical of the leadership style of, uh, of Merkel anyway, uh, to work in that way. Uh, they would uh, assist another country there, but it's still Germany doing it uh, uh, on an individual basis. And this is the world that we're in. And it says something if there has not been some kind of collaborative way of dealing with uh, a major global emergency. It talks about the state of the world. Right. And it also talks about the ineffectiveness of uh, an, a leadership infrastructure that relies on the hardware of institutions and so on. It, uh, when people's, when the real uh, agendas, the real feelings about insecurity, the real uh, determination to do something has been laid to bear, 
it hasn't demonstrated collectiveness. It hasn't demonstrated that, oh, I, I, I trust the ability of all of us collectively uh, to work together. And that's the state of the world. And so we have not been able to achieve global mobilization against this in a way that I was also talking about societal mobilization at the national level. Some have done it, uh, some haven't uh, done it, but globally, there has not been a global mobilization. And I think we're just going to see uh, the, uh, the singular um, assertion of influence among states, I mean, by a state, uh, those, the usual suspects, China that you've mentioned, so in their regions, in the world uh, at large, and with varying degrees of successes. I don't know what that means for the United Nations. Um, and that's a threat to the United Nations, I have to say, because that kind of action, if it cannot be brought together within a global uh, uh, institution that is able to at least convene, if they cannot convene themselves and they cannot convene uh, everyone within that global institution, it's, uh, it doesn't spell uh, something positive for the way the world is going. But I want to believe that very quickly. Uh, every time this has happened, uh, a, a voice of reasoning comes that tries to bring everybody together uh, under the same roof. And I suspect that would happen. But for some time, we're going to see that contestation. It will be China. It will be the US still trying to assert itself whilst um, but that leadership, once, once the leader changes, and is bound to change if not this year, in another four years, we might see a reorganization of uh, the US's uh, influence. But until then, it will be the US struggling uh, to think about power uh, differently, whilst China is trying to really occupy that space. But we're going to see Russia, we're going to see in Africa a new kind of conversation. Uh, let's see what happens with, uh, with South Africa and Rwanda uh, in terms of emergence. Uh, Nigeria, for one, uh, I think it's its place to be taken if it's serious. Um, I don't know. I'm quite unclear about uh, Nigeria's traditional le leadership space for all sorts of reasons, because there's a lot happening internally uh, that it needs to grapple with. But, but uh, the state of the world uh, has been laid bare by coronavirus. Correct. It's uh, uh, like... The a swimming pool that has been emptied. So yes, yes, yes. You, can, you can tell those who are wearing swimming trunks and those who are not. Um, um, a final question uh, for me, um, you know, you, you are part of the senior leadership team of, uh, at King's College um, in, 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 in London. And uh, you, you, you are a founder of the Africa Leadership Center. Um, just, just one last question. You know, you're already coping with the impact of this uh, pandemic on higher education. I know it's an area of interest of yours, um, but what what do you perceive the impact to be so far? And what changes do you think might take place which are going to become, which will be resilient? And, and you know, in other words, point to a completely new way of, 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 uh, uh, of delivering and engaging in higher education. So I, I, absolutely. I, I mean, you've just touched on what is a, not just it, it, uh, it's a big area of interest for me at the moment. It's also a big area of concern um, as someone who's in charge of international affairs at King's College London. As you know, uh, King's has, uh, it's one of the Russell Group uh, 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 universities uh, in the UK. We have a large a uh, number of international students. We attract students from all over the world. We have uh, in the range of 11 to 12,000 students from 150 countries. And then we have a large number of home students as well, European students too. So already Brexit raised uncertainties before now uh, about uh, what will happen to uh, our students from Europe. Uh, there are many other universities in this uh, situation as well, but so, so in, in policy terms, the United Kingdom relies, uh, you know, and prides itself on being able to attract students from different parts of the world. 
And in the next 10 years, I think it's estimated that there will be about 600,000 international, it was estimated, about 600,000 international students coming in physically into the UK. So that kind of mobility has always been relied upon. Um, and uh, British education is one that many students uh, would, always, uh, would always pride themselves, you know, want to be uh, receiving. But in this new context, um, this 10-year uh, approach that by 2030 would have had, say, uh, 600,000 international students in the UK is threatened for the United Kingdom, for, for four kings uh, as well. We don't know, no one knows whether there will be business as usual in September. Um, and so it is those universities that have prepared themselves for the future that will seem to find themselves on top of things. Uh, I guess it, if this was five years ago, we will probably also be tearing our hair out and worrying about what we'll do. But we have embraced technology a lot in the past five or so years. Um, online education and blended education has been a key part of what we do at King's. And we have done it in stages. My own ambition for Africa for a long time has, has always been that we will build, I'll be able to build some kind of equal partnership with African institutions, either by jointly awarding degrees, so that uh, whether you are in Pretoria or in Nairobi, if you want a good quality education, uh, King or you're in London, we can, you can have access to that good quality education, split campus arrangements. But, but I see a future uh, that is bright uh, as far as uh, this is concerned when it comes to the fact that the average age in Africa at the moment is 19 to 20 uh, years and we're going to have millions of Africans uh, wanting good quality high education in the future. And I think in a sense, uh, universities like King's, uh, similar universities will be thinking about how those students will be able to get quality education from kings in my uh, in our case but also we'll be able to have the kind of partnership in which that kind of education is shared with a whole number of african institutions the dilemma though is that the inequality in that is laid bare because if you can't even have the infrastructure that gives you uh, access to the uh, to the internet that gives you access how on earth are you uh, online? And this is a, really the, the challenge now for many of us. It's part of the insecurity that I think governments will have to address. So when we think of public expenditure from now on, that is a canker that has read its head. And our countries across the board, we have to think about this, building this capacity very quickly because with an average age of 19 years, it will be terrible if we cannot deliver good quality education to our, uh, to our citizens, to young Africans. I'm passionate about this and I hope that, I'm convinced that we'll find a way forward. At King's, we're thinking about this uh, constantly as well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fumi Oloni Sakim. Uh, thank you so much for your time. That was very, very insightful. Uh, and I look forward to to chatting again we're in lockdown so we i know we, <laughs> even though we are far from each other we are also close uh, yes, but, yeah. but, but to, just to express uh, my gratitude and that of the elephant for taking time to give us that really, really uh, very profound set of insights thank you for me thank you so much john good to see you again nice yeah? to see you again Stay safe. <laughs> thank you too Bye.